Now, could you explain what it means for a government to be held in contempt to Parliament, and what implications does this or should this have? You know, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, I, I don't actually know what it means. I, I got a sense it's bad. You know, it doesn't sound good. Um, my, my, my sense is that, you know, Parliament makes its own rules and it tries to enforce a certain kind of behavior. Usually this isn't an issue because one party has a majority and they can pretty much discipline everybody. So it, it, it sort of keeps the, the teeth in because at the end of the day the government knows it's going to win every vote. So then they can afford to be magnanimous and all carry on as if they're good buddies and friends there. When we have a minority parliament like this one, and particularly one where the conservatives are on the outs, it's hard for them to make alliances with any other parties. It's hard for them to make alliances with the Bloc or the NDP because both parties have kind of some social democratic aspects that, of course, the Conservatives are completely against. They have a lot in common with the Liberals. In fact, the logical coalition is between the Conservatives and Liberals. But, of course, they can't get together because of the nature of competition in our system, because both parties want it all. Neither one wants to share. Uh, so that's why the, the Conservatives are really on the outs. They've got no partners, and that has made them uh, act in much more vicious ways to try to maintain control. Uh, and that's why I think this contempt issue has come up. It's very unusual, because for the most part it's a gentleman's agreement. You know, they all meet across the pub or the press club, they work out their differences, they come back and they agree to disagree. Harper is a different kind of politician. I mean, he really is an ideologue. I mean, he's in it to make big changes, not to just broker some compromises in different parts of the country. So it's, it's partly Harper's agenda and the kind of conservative party he is. It's partly uh, the nature of a minority parliament where the largest party has got no friends. Uh, you mentioned competition and the nature of competition. Can you elaborate a little bit about that and the competition between the parties for government? In our voting system, in, our, you know, in, in part of our, our, our larger electoral system, there's not a lot of incentives for the parties to work together. People think of, you know, oh, there's an election going on, some MPs are getting elected. In fact, we've got 308 elections going on at the same time, and every single one of them is sudden death over time. You know, there's no friendliness, there can be no, hey, let's work together, because only one person can win in each riding. So, there's not much incentive for the parties to work together, because if I help you, I'm helping you beat me. Now that's different, say, in a proportional voting system. Most of the world's uh, democratic countries use proportional voting. Mm -hmm. And in proportional voting, there's a lot more incentive for parties to work together because they know that they're not going to get all the votes. And the votes that are for another party probably were never coming to them anyway. So there's not much competition that way. Mm -hmm. Whereas, again, in our system, uh, in, a, in the case of a minority government, you might think, well, maybe the parties should get together. Maybe they should work together but they can't because they're all thinking, well, I want to get back to the election. If I can get back to an election, maybe I can convert 40% of the votes into 100% of the power. Mm -hmm. And so that's very, very uh, tantalizing, intoxicating. And uh, so that's why our, our parties often carry on the way they do. So uh, looking at some at democratic and electoral reform, um, do you think there's benefits to Canadians to look at different systems and to look at or look at tweaking our system or moving towards something like proportional re representation or SDV or MMP? Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's lots of arguments in, in favor of our current system. It's just they're not democratic ones. Uh, you know, they're great for dictatorships. Um, you know, why should we have our system? Because it's stable. Well, dictatorships are stable. You know, why mess with democracy? Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, our system is supposed to have such great local representation, except nobody votes on the basis of a local member. Everybody votes on the basis of a party. So, for the most part, our system is defended in very pragmatic terms by self-interested political players who benefit from it. Uh, it's not in the interests of voters, unless voters like the idea that only their party will be in charge and doesn't have to listen to anyone else. What's interesting about the arguments for voting system reform is that y you could make the case that it's in the interest of all the parties, or to put it differently, it's in the interest of the voters of all the parties. Because all the parties in some ways get punished by our current system. If you're a conservative in downtown Toronto, forget about it, might as well stay home, you're never going to influence the result. But under a PR election, you would contribute you know, to the result of the conservatives. And think about how the conservatives might be a different party if those urban conservatives had some influence over the party rather than you know, the, the demographic of, of the ones who win under our system. So yeah, I mean, Canadians have got nothing to lose by looking somewhere else. 
our current system is a pre-democratic holdover. Um, it, it ritualistically uh, frustrates what Canadian voters are trying to do. It fails in the most basic objectives of a, of a representative system. Uh, it doesn't actually represent very accurately what people have said with their votes. Um, now, um, all of the parties have put forward different um, aspects in their platform on democratic reform. Some have said we want to look at the electoral system. Often these aspects kind of fall off the table once they're in government. Why do you think that that happens? Oh, well, you know, there's lots of uh, arguments about why that takes place. Lots of times politicians will trumpet reform, but mostly what they want is window dressing. Things like fixed election dates. Oh, they love fixed election dates. Oh, and they all rush in to put in fixed election dates. Why? Because it's useless. Because it doesn't really change anything. Um, if it's inconvenient, they forget about it, like Harper did in 2008. And, uh, and, and on the other hand, the fixed election date is probably okay for the parties. You know, it allows them to do all kinds of planning. But it's not a democratic reform doesn't really offer the public very much. So that reform gets rushed through. Voting system reform, on the other hand, well, first of all, it's very rare. Very rarely occurs. Voting systems are, are some of the stickiest rules in, in Western democracies. Uh, they only tend to change under the threat of major social upheaval. So, you know, in Canada in the 1970s, Quebec was talking about leaving the country. Not enough. Not good enough to change the voting system. There was some talk, but it never went anywhere. Um, people have talked about the need to represent diversity. Not enough of a threat. You know, everybody you know, bows down to it, but nobody does anything about it. Historically, voting systems have typically changed when various class interests are threatened, uh, when business interests are threatened. So the major change in Europe occurred around World War I when it looked like a major revolution was, was rolling over the continent. Uh, or more recently, it happened uh, over, over struggles around neoliberalism, mm -hmm. either to get neoliberalism or stop neoliberalism. So there's always got to be a, a very important economic challenge mm -hmm. to, the, to the threats. Um, or maybe we could have a situation where the public is well informed enough to demand it. But that's really hard to do. Okay. Now, looking at this current election, is there any... Um Anything that stands out or elements um, that you found surprising watching the campaigns? Well, once again, we see the two major campaigns completely disconnected from the reality of most Canadians' lives. Uh, neither one seems to have any idea about what it's like to live in this society with the level of inequality, uh, the joblessness, uh, the poor jobs that are available, the cost of living. Um, I mean, really, it's like a George Bush moment, right? Remember George Bush Sr. goes to the supermarket, has no idea what a scanner is. Because he never goes to them. Someone else does his shopping. And in a way, you know, both the liberals and the conservatives um, live in a kind of upper middle class fantasy uh, that all Canadians, you know, gather around the water cooler uh, to discuss last night's episode of whatever. Uh, which, of course, ignores the fact that most Canadians don't work uh, in an environment with a water cooler. Right? Most Canadians work in the service sector. Uh, they work for wages, uh, and many of them are struggling to try to keep up with the, the economic changes that we've seen over the last 20 years. So, once again, we have an election where the media and the two major parties uh, offer a bunch of issues that arguably are relating to the public. They do respond to some of the things that the public wants. But what's interesting are the things that are never talked about. And I, I find it, you know, almost laughable that Stephen Harper can get up and talk about what a great job he's done on the economy when he has presided over some of the largest gaps in income, uh, you know, some of the biggest challenges facing uh, working people in the country. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the New Democrats have tried to put this on the table. Uh, Jack talks about the challenges facing average people. I think they could have done more. I think they could have done more to help people understand that we live in an economy of winners and losers. And to the extent the winners win, others lose. And continuing to foment this idea that everyone can win, that we can all be winners, I think is, is very dangerous because that's just not the way the system works. Um, I think that the New Democrats' attempt to cuddle up to small business is also pretty silly. You know, small business is not the engine of a modern economy. And small business are some of the worst employers in the country. Uh, they have the lowest levels of unionization. So in terms of the kinds of work that would give people meaningful, dignified work where they have some control over the workplace, it's not going to be small business. Okay, so 
I, I think a social democratic party should be helping people to understand that mm -hmm. rather than playing up to sort of these fantasies of the mom and pop mm -hmm. store, um, you know, which mostly succeed by exploiting their own families. Mm -hmm. Um, so now currently, uh, looking at the polls, and please comment if you want to on polling itself, um, the NDP is polling much higher than in the start of the election, and the Liberals are polling much lower than the start of the election. Uh, what would you attribute this to? Well, I would definitely say that people should be cautious about polls. You know, polls are not benign. Polls are as much an instrument of politics as they are a reflection of politics. They, billions of dollars are spent on them, okay? I should tell you something. Follow the money. Um, when that much money is being spent, powerful people want something. Uh, so polls are used to try to convince people that the things that they want are unrealistic. You know what? Nobody supports that. Nobody else. You're a loser if you think that. And so that has the effect of making people go, oh, okay, I guess I can't have that. So now, on the other hand, I mean, polling is measuring something. And uh, so we do see some changes uh, in terms of the kinds of things that people are saying uh, that they want in the elections. Um, but polling is facing some challenges. Polling has relied traditionally on people with landlines. Uh, not everybody has landlines anymore. Um, polling reaches the people who are most motivated to vote. Uh, and in a way, that makes them a little more accurate uh, because not everybody who might have an opinion about politics goes out to vote. And that has a particularly classed and youth effect. So youth don't turn out to vote, mm -hmm. the working class and the poor don't turn out to vote as much as people in other categories. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've seen some changes in the polling in this election. Uh, for the most part, uh, the Harper Conservatives have remained within the 34 to 39% polling. Uh, and, and you know, conservative voters are very motivated to vote. Uh, they're older, they're whiter, uh, they're, they're more male, uh, they're richer. Uh, and they take voting seriously. So uh, we know that there's a solid core of conservative voters. The liberal vote is, is, is curious. Um, the million liberal voters in Ontario who came out to vote, who didn't come out to vote in the last election, don't appear to be coming back, at least not coming back to the liberals. And I would attribute that in part to Ignatiev's uh, leadership. He hasn't done anything to distinguish the liberals. Uh, he's played up pretty much to the conservative agenda. Uh, so there's not much reason to distinguish him from the other, the other conservative party. Um, this thing that's going on with the NDP in Quebec is very interesting. Is it real? Uh, are we seeing a change? Possibly. Quebec has foxed the country again and again. Whenever everyone else is being pushed in the corner and told, you can't have what you want, it's all set, the election's practically over, Quebec comes along and does something different. They did it um, in, in, in the 60s with the Quiet Revolution. They did it again in the 70s, electing the PQ at the provincial level. Um, they used to elect the, the Real Creditiste, um, or Social Creditiste, uh, which was the social credit version in Quebec in the 60s. And then more recently, of course, they elected the Bloc. Now they're saying, no, nah, we're fed up. We don't like the options, and maybe we're going to go with the NDP. Of course, it's, we don't know whether or not the NDP has the forces on the ground to actually capture that vote. So it's not enough for polls to say people think they might vote for the NDP. They might not show up. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. If they did, it would be a major change, mm -hmm. uh, a major change in the country. Uh, it would present some challenges for the NDP because they would have a significant group of, of French representatives. And we know what happened last time. Right? Phil Edmondson was elected for the NDP in a by-election, and before his term was out, he was sitting as an independent. So it, the, the NDP has had a really tough time bringing you know, French and English together within their own party. And that reflects some very negative views about Quebec in places like Saskatchewan and Manitoba and BC. Mm -hmm. So that, there's going to be work to be done if they succeed. But if they succeed, uh, it could be a very interesting time for the country. Uh, it would be an important smack in the face to our neoliberal media and to our two conventional parties mm -hmm. that you are, out, you are out to lunch. You, 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 you've priced yourself out of the market. You are too far away from what people actually want. And that, that's part of the radical kernel in democracy, that there's always a chance that the people will do something <laughs> unpredictable. And, uh, and, and let's hope they do. That's, that's the promise. People shouldn't get their hopes too high because the New Democrats are not a radical party. Um, at the provincial level, they've, they've introduced a lot of neoliberal policies in Manitoba and British Columbia and Saskatchewan. And there certainly are those advocates at the federal level. Um, but it's something. It's something that a party that is regularly called socialists uh, in the press would get this kind of support.
um, it, 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 it jams the message that our, our dominant media and their supporters uh, would like us to believe. And I, I think that's a good thing.